Hello, I'm horror cartoonist Dennis St. John. I draw monsters and write twisted tales. As you can imagine, I was a little obsessed with Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Lucky for me, so were most of my high school friends. All except one. One friend who stubbornly refused to join the Scoobies. So here we are, 20 some odd years later. I'm teaming up with Doc Travis, John Teach Landis, and maybe a special guest or two. And we're going to make our friend, Michael Poli, watch one episode of Buffy a week until he's no longer the Buffy Virgin. Hey everybody, welcome back to Buffy Virgin. Uh, we're on season four, episode 15, This Year's Girl. Uh, I'm your host, Dennis St. John. Uh, I'm joined by the usual cast. And uh, why don't you all introduce yourself from oldest to youngest? I believe I am the oldest. I am 37 years old. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm the Virgin. I am watching Buffy for the first time, and season four, episode 15 is as far as I've gotten. So excited to share it with y'all. I believe I'm second oldest. Uh, my name is John. I'm this year's dude. Happy to be on the program yet again. And that would make you the youngest. Yep, I'm the youngest. Yep, I'm Travis. Um, just a big, big old Buffy fan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. You all passed my pop quiz. <laughs> uh, so let's move on to reactions. We have re reactions from uh, the I and team this week. Audience reactions. So uh, Renee uh, at Ren and Oz. Um, so we, we got some reactions uh, this week from folks explaining uh, letting us know what happened to um, uh, Maggie Walsh. So uh, Buffy Virgin, uh, so Ren and Oz says um, at Buffy Virgin Pod, okay, so Lindsay Krauss quit the show abruptly to take up another gig. This meant very quick slash impactful rewrites to the back half of the season as Maggie was the big bad uh, with Adam as an ancillary part of that plot. Uh, his character essentially was similarly existential. Uh, I'd also say that I don't think the Adam, I don't think that Adam, even slightly resembles the mayor. In fact, in many ways, they are diametrically opposed. Uh, Adam, by nature of being a creation, has no agency in his arrival on the villain scene, as opposed to Mayor Wilkins, who played a century, a centuries-old Long Kong. Um, and that, I think, is a reaction to Travis, right, talking about the mayor? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she says, um, all this is to say that I think some of the issues or I'm going to say issues, uh, with the back half of season four in terms of story pacing slash choices makes a lot more sense with this info, uh, given uh, what they were dealing with. I think they actually do well, and it's my fave finale. Well, we can't talk about that yet. Um, uh, and Rich um, at Dingo Action says, uh, a couple of noticings. Uh, during the briefing on the Polgara demon when Buffy is asking questions, she refers to it as the polka thing, or the polka thingy. Um, and when, when Willow returns to their room after spending the night at Terra's, she has the crystal, which I've never oh. noticed before. Uh, That's but she's, crystal. she actually uses the crystal to do the, um, uh, static electricity spell. Interesting. <laughs> is that, is that the family heirloom crystal? Yeah. Oh, okay. Good catch. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Um, and Rich also says, excellent summary, 100. So that's on you, John. Yay. Praise. Uh, Sagov9 also says, that summary was hilarious. Double so praise. The internet loves me. <laughs> get, get ready to be disappointed, Sagov9. Uh, and, uh, My summary sucks. <laughs> and Anonymous, Anonymous uh, says, uh, the actress for Maggie Walsh left the show early for scheduling conflict, according to one Buffy writers, one of the Buffy writers. Uh, the original plan was for her to be the season's big bad. So yeah, we're getting confirmation on that. That seems to be what happened, which does make sense because there, it is like this weird buildup about Maggie that just suddenly disappears. Thank you, thank you everybody for writing in and uh, explaining to us about that. Um, so let's move on to the summary. I believe it's provided this week by our resident resident. The summary. Buffy, season four, episode fifteen. This year's girl. First broadcast, February 22nd, year 2000. This year's girl is a lot like last year's girl, except more unhinged, maybe. Let's see. Murderous Faith has been in a coma for eight months, psychically battling Buffy until she finally escapes her own grave, it appears, and bursts back into the real world. She's well-rested, psychotic, out for revenge, 
Did I mention she wants to kill Buffy? She's been having what appears to be nightmares about Buffy for the past eight months, which would put anyone in a monstrous state of mind. But Willow reminds us, she's not technically a monster. If you thought Faith wasn't playing without the rulebook before, she took the three rules she was following and threw those out the window. She's unhinged. Oh, I said that already? She's a seething, raging, and wonderfully unpredictable slayer. If anyone could actually kill Adam, so-called this year's big bad, it's actually Faith, this year's girl. But let's talk about this year's boyfriend for a second. Boring, weak, monotone voice, pretty unapologetic. Forgive me, I'd take an evil angel over this giant bowl of cereal any day. That's what Riley is, cereal. You can't spice up cereal, folks. But thank God we get this year's girl back to entertain us with a body swap magic trick courtesy of her dearly departed mayor slash dad. I disagree, Travis, that you cannot um, uh, spice up cereal. I've been uh, experimenting with uh, savory oatmeal in the last few days. <laughs> And uh, like hot sauce and a little olive oil and cheese in your oatmeal is really good. Oh, oatmeal isn't cereal though. Yeah, it's a cereal. It's a grain, but a cereal is like processed grain for the most part. Like in a different way, the oatmeal is kind of less processed. All Spicy right. cereal is not going to happen. <laughs> you can't make it happen. You can make oatmeal with bacon. I make guarantee you like this cereal. <laughs> Uh, good job, Trev. Um, yeah, so for those who haven't watched the episode before, this is the episode where Faith comes back. Uh, and it's amazing. So amazing. I'm so ha- I missed her so much. Uh, she just adds so much craziness to the show. I, so given that Walsh is like the big bad, would Faith have never come back if like uh, they, they got what they were planning initially? I don't know. I mean, I feel like this is such the like this episode needed to happen right like that's why you put faith in a coma and not like kill her outright but it would have been interesting maybe maybe in some alternate reality to have like faith working for the initiative since they like buffy they lost buffy and she's like their new slayer dude yeah and it yeah it shows like how morally corrupt the initiative is they don't recognize they even have the dark slayer i like it like see bit of faith eat forest yeah <laughs> <laughs> why is she a cannibal now i just think that 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 relationship would happen and forrest would be woefully unprepared for a relationship with faith yeah like he thinks he's like all that and everything and then not able to handle it at all I find his bones later <laughs> uh let's move on to, to great lines great lines uh, I really love uh, Buffy talking to Willow, trying to get her to hack into the initiative. She says, Willow, I need you to hack into the security mainframe and buy me a 10 minute shutdown of all operational systems. And later she's like, if you can't do it online, use magic. <laughs> Isn't it great to just be the boss and to make plans? And yeah. <laughs> I want someone to tell me that well, they like need me to do something. They're like, you know, listen, we need you to like, you know, you know, post this to the website. And if you can't do it online, use magic. <laughs> So this this line I love is when uh, information about Faith getting loose or out of the hospital uh, gets dropped to the Scooby gang and then Xander says, I hate to see the pursuit of a homicidal lunatic get in the way of pursuing a homicidal lunatic. <laughs> so good. Yeah. They got a lot on their plate. Uh, so this one's more of a paraphrase because this one, this uh, was a long uh, monologue. So I just took the beginning and the end. So I kept having this dream. Not sure what it means. This self-righteous blonde chick stabs me. And she goes on and on, and including the word beef, college beef stick, which I liked. Um, she goes, so that's my dream. That and some stuff about cigars in a tunnel. Tell me, college girl, what does it mean? <laughs> uh, uh, this one, um, John, do you want to do Tara? And I can be sure. Willow? Don't worry, we're sure to spot her Faith first. She's like this cleavagely slut bomb walking around going, Oh, check me out. I'm wicked cool. I'm five by five. Five by five? Five what by five what? See, that's the thing. No one knows. <laughs> I'd like to say we solved this mystery. Yeah. I, this this we stood did? out to me partially yes. because John already did the detective work that Willow never did. Five by five is a military, oh, military uh, term to describe like the how good your communications are. That's the best yeah. your communications can be. I still like the idea of it being five fingers by five toes, but <laughs> like, you can't be doing that bad if you have all your fingers and all your toes. 
That's you're still half missing. Five. That's half no, no. of them, Travis. But you're symmetric. There's there's two halves to you. You don't oh. you don't have to say ten by ten. I mean, ten by ten seems just like a little like ten by ten is just dimensions. Yeah. Uh, Trev, do you want to be uh, Xander or do you want to be? Um, I think we uh, should make our, our resident Englishman no, be, uh, be Spike, and I'll be Xander. Actually, okay. Mike really should be Xander, but, but it's my quote. We have a rogue slayer on our hands. Sounds serious. What do you need? Her, dark hair, yay tall, name of faith, criminally insane. Is this bird after your... In a bad way. Tell you what I'll do. Head out. Find this girl. Tell her where you all are, and then watch as she kills you. Can any one of your damn little Scooby Club at least try to remember that I hate you all? Yeah. This is a great quote. It's a very half-hearted <laughs> attempt at an accent there. On no, it was actually it was better than what I was going to pull out. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was good. I actually yeah. thought... Oh, he's like doing it a little mellow. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's easing into it. He's yeah, really he's picking to... up this, the subtleties of this accent. <laughs> it's a good interpretation. All right, let's move on to Kill Count. The Kill Count. So I'm, I counted three dream murders, one non-fatal electrocuting. <laughs> Uh, two demons, including one like brutally uh, dissected, uh, two knockouts, and one awaking from a coma, which counts against the score. Oh. <laughs> so uh, let's move on to weird noticings and trivia. Weird noticings. John, why don't you start us off? Very beginning of the episode inside the dream. And I realize it's a dream and there's dream logic. But one of the things Buffy says is clean sheets like summer. It, which makes me think that Buffy only changes her sheets once a year. It's like, oh, it's summer. Time to get the new sheets out. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's dream logic. Yeah. I bet, though, given who Buffy is and where she's at in life, I bet she's never changed her sheets. Whoa. Uh, I bet... Joyce has asked her to do it a hundred times and she never has. She's been in that dorm room at like at least six months now. I bet she changed the sheets at home, but I bet she didn't, she hasn't changed the sheets at dorm. That's a good question. We never see them doing laundry in the episode. I think she changed the sheets between boyfriends at least, right? (laughs) Well, are you talking about Parker and Riley? Didn't she stay at Parker's place? Yeah, she stayed at Parker's. Oh, so right. She wouldn't have to change her dorm sheets then. Never mind. I bet she's never changed her sheets. This is gross. Let's move on. <laughs> well, it's not just like, it, just in general, you know, skin cells. But <laughs> man, you're talking about little sis coming? What, what's going on with this dream sequence, Mike? Shut up, Travis. <laughs> this is a cryptic dream sequence. It deserves a prediction. The first dream sequence when they're changing the sheets? Yeah, do you remember? They, they said a bunch of stuff during it. Yeah, they do say a lot of stuff. I was just gonna say in the first dream sequence, like since Slayers had, since Buffy and Faith have shared a dream, I wonder if like at the beginning that's really Buffy, right? If that's like a real interaction they're having. Oh right. Like later on when she be- goes full on like Jason Voorhees, I don't think that's her, but I was wondering if, if Buffy had been having faith faith dreams. It doesn't seem like she's been having faith dreams, but it feels like Buffy should be psychically linked to Faith, like most of her adversaries. But it seems like Faith is the only one having dreams. Yeah. Uh, it well, feels they, to me like the first dream is from Buffy's point of view. I feel like the first one is yeah. Buffy's dream. That's what I thought too. Dream. But it definitely transitions when like right. the She's, murdering happens. I don't know. I mean, I still think it might be a Faith dream because Faith is the one with the with the uh, the knife in her stomach. And, and then they cut to Faith instead of cutting to Buffy asleep. They're cutting to Faith in the coma after the dream, which to me says, yeah, this, this is more of a Faith dream still. Or maybe um, Slayers have access to like a collective dream chat room. Yeah, I think they do. I don't think they always use that access. Yeah, I, I think they must be there. psychically linked. I mean, they, they have to be. I mean, it's Buffy's they've, psych- had, they've had shared dreams before. Yeah. So. I don't know. So, yeah. It's just so, like Buffy doesn't talk about how, oh yeah, I keep having these dreams where I murder Faith. Because <laughs> it doesn't, they don't just doesn't say that. So Travis, you pointed out a very specific line that like, totally glazed over when I watched this. And I watched this episode twice, right? But the uh, little sis coming I know line, is there 
so literally the, the prediction would be Faith, Buffy and Faith, the Faith, the Faith. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so one of them ha- <laughs> that there's a Buffy has a little sister that she hasn't met. Well, I don't know if that's the exact prediction, but there's also like there's just weird cryptic stuff. But like the last time Buffy and Faith saw each other, like right when they when Buffy almost killed Faith, weren't they talking about something cryptic? And they, they, have a, they have a shared coma dream. They have like a previously time. shared coma dream, like from season three, it feels like. They, they recite some nursery rhyme or something. I have to go back and check. It's just like, it's just like a weird thing they talk about. They're like, got to get things ready. It's like, okay. I mean, uh, <laughs> let's, let's move on. <laughs> okay, it's just, a, it's just a weird cryptic. Maybe come back and make a prediction about it or... Watch the scene again and give us a prediction. Maybe next episode. Uh, <laughs> John, you have a question. Uh, yes. So, is Giles at the beginning of this episode still hanging out at Xander's house? Because at the beginning, Giles is folding underwear in Xander's basement, and then later in the episode, he's back at his own house. And there's no scene in between explaining that they're no longer in hiding. Is there, or did I miss it? No, you didn't miss it. But I think I think that's what happened. I think they were still in hiding. Um, yeah, it's not until Riley like shows back up again, right? Right. That's like yeah. missing. So when Riley shows back up, were they like, we don't need to hide anymore because we have Riley? Or I think Riley showing up pointed out how stupid it is to hide in Xander's. Okay. Because obviously so Riley knows where they are. It's not a case of Giles just folding Xander's laundry for no reason. <laughs> not as far as I can tell. <laughs> no, I think they're hiding because they're all there at Xander's and everything watching not paying attention to xander getting electrocuted <laughs> <laughs> so uh i'm curious about the demon autopsy that happens and maybe this is a dennis question but if you're an adam performing a demon autopsy uh you do it outside and have the demon between a bunch of trees and also really high up like it seems like adam would need a ladder both to <laughs> like hang the demon and then also to like get any vi- visual information because like <laughs> autopsy you want to do the thing that's horizontal so I think a couple things could have happened. Adam did the autopsy of the demon and then strung him up to like scare people or he has no idea what he's doing because he's a weird robot. But the <laughs> autopsy thing, it's like you're, we're looking at a, something that is, it would be an overhead view then kind of put, put up uh, like in a tree somehow. Anyway, it just seemed really crazy, but it visually totally shocking to see a demon yeah. <laughs> autopsy in a tree. But it just feels like that's not, no one's learning anything. From Did that you notice style. it was smoking? If yeah. you look carefully, the demon body is like smoking. It's super creepy. It's it's smoking kills. I mean, <laughs> I've said it before. I mean, I don't know how many times I've said it, but smoking kills, man. You heard it here first, folks, from a doctor. <laughs> Controversial medical opinion. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, it looks like, you know, an illuminated manuscript from like the Spanish Inquisition or something. Like, it's definitely not for learning. It's just for, like, shocking murder, right? I mean, if you're, like, some sort of psychopathic demon who's, you know, ripping the insides of another psychopathic-looking demon inside out, I mean, when you're done, you're probably like, man, I got to put this on the wall. And it's like, <laughs> you walls, but you got trees. It's like when I just put a bunch of stuff on my walls. I mean, they weren't, like, open dead bodies, but you know, <laughs> I was, you know, kind of a nomadic, homeless kind of, super demon makes sense makes a certain kind of sense i also like that the demon looks like the actual devil but it's like yeah. i don't know like let's really try our hardest to say how tough adam is he murdered the devil yeah <laughs> it's funny that both faith and adam are like killing demons this up so it's like not a huge priority to take care of him <laughs> <laughs> i do like faith's demon murder at the near the end it's so like Oh, the messenger demon? Yeah. yeah. That poor guy. <laughs> I mean, it's like the exact reason why people say don't kill the messenger, because it's it invariably happens. Like he's probably, you know, like he's probably been in the room with Faith before during like mayor meetings and stuff, and it was like just assumes Faith's gonna recognize him. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't put up a defense at all, just, just <laughs> next next. next. Uh, Mike, uh, you got this next point here. Yep. So I don't think that Riley deserves to come back to the Scooby gang. I feel like he really eviscerated that relationship 
just in the last episode where you know he's kind of pushing willow around pulls a gun on an unarmed person like we're possibly full vampire like really shows that he's a drug addict kind of is completely strung out and now because he's been in the hospital after getting poked like now he's recovered completely so like whatever the arc was of riley's drug addiction just like you know walsh's kind of whatever season being cut short like riley's career you know also got cut short and now like hey let's just put him back on the team and it's fine because it's an episodic series but it's kind of annoying because it's like i want things to mean things yeah and if he's just back on the team and like everyone's like hey it's cool don't worry about it like willow forgives him right away pointedly and like buffy's just like i was just worried about it. we were gonna go rescue you somehow like I just feel so unsatisfying for Riley to come back on the team. Uh, there are a couple really fun things that happen when Riley comes back, but uh, I was still like, I was really angry at the show for making that choice. Yeah. I wrote down, um, Willow may forgive you, but I will not. <laughs> <laughs> See, now, like you're, now you're on my never forgive Giles train. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it, it also seems like, like, so, you know, Xander never had a good relationship with Angel. Uh, and, so it's a little weird this is happening again but like i agree with xander in this episode when he's like yeah it's the least you can do it like he's apparently the only person who remembers last week <laughs> you know what? i mean gosh I, I looked at i looked at the maggie walsh's like discography filmography it's like it's like she didn't like quit this production to be the star of gladiator i mean i i, I looked at it and there's like nothing remarkable <laughs> at this time period and i'm like why why would you destroy the these this second half of season four if you weren't doing some like mega movie? I just like I'm I looked at her filmography and it's, there's just nothing there. I don't know. I mean, we don't know what happened internally. Like she yeah. not gotten along with Jess Whedon or Well yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean that's, sexual yeah. harassment is a pretty real reason to leave a show if that's indeed what's going on, right? Yeah, well, that that would be, but to say that like they left for like a different gig, like that's a different thing. Like, it, that, that, that could be the the stated reason, and we don't know. Like, we don't know anything about the. Well, yeah, but I'm going off the quote stated reason. I'm yeah. not going off the like a like a rumor. I'm just saying like that's the stated reason. It's just so weak. Um, the only person who's left the show where it's like clearly, you know, well, I guess quotes better is like Seth Green, right? Like Seth Green to do, I guess, like his own stuff. Yeah, and Jenny Callender left to be the reporter on Spawn the movie. Uh, oh. No, I mean, she's the reporter on Spawn the movie. I don't think that's why she left the show. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just like, that's the only other thing she's in that I know of. Uh, how about Dream Mayor Wilkins and the Snake? I fucking love that. Uh, I love that, like, Faith's dream conception of Mayor Wilkins is exactly the like version of of Wilkins he pretends to be. He's like, I don't know. It's nice to see that relationship again, and like to but to cast him as like this like innocent figure is really funny. Uh, making Buffy the monster. Uh, I love that scene. Another dream sequence where Faith is running from Buffy before falling into her own grave. Yes, it's so beautiful, and I just. I, wow, I had to rewind that one to watch it again at home later. It was just so good. And then she crawls up out of her own grave, and that's the transition to her waking up. So good. Yeah. I, love I that. wish they, that was the show opener. It's just, like, so powerful. Mm -hmm. I love, like, that Buffy's just walking. She's, like, moving, like, Jason Voorhees style, which, like, the show never does that, but it can do it in a dream. Um, and, yeah, falling into your own grave and then pulling yourself out, like... It's well, solid stuff. Yeah, and normally the show is really shot, you know, not handheld, but like on, I'm going to say on sticks, but like on a tripod or whatever, like, or like with some steady cam stuff. But like they, they follow her kind of perfectly. The grave is a surprise when she falls in. I was a little bit shocked. And then they cut to a crane shot, you know, not even the crane shot that they eventually end on where she's like, like looking out of the sky, but they cut to this crane shot of her in the grave, like kind of desperate looking. And it's just awesome to see that powerful figure that you know kind of reversed in that way and then buffy hopping into the grave is just like out of a nightmare oh that which like really makes it clear that it's a nightmare it's just so well done yeah but the, the shot you're talking about the shot after she gets out though is yeah. totally the full shawshank redemption oh yeah that's <laughs> unnecessary i hate that <laughs> they ruin a perfect scene sequence with that shawshank shit yeah 
Uh, yeah, and then she wakes up and she's in like the shittiest wing of a hospital ever. Yeah, so, uh, okay, which wing of the Amazon warehouse do they stash people? You know, <laughs> like, like, yeah, which is it's insane. Around? Yeah, it's like, what the, where, there, this is a Travis question. Which wing of the hospital do you put comatose people in? Is it like some abandoned wing nobody ever goes into? There is an iron lung in the, like, hallway. <laughs> It fits this crazy fictional thing, man. Well, they got the refrigerated love- stuff, you know, where the cafeteria might be. It makes sense to put comatose people near the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's wild. Also, like that girl walking around who's looking for third floor west. Like, you are so nowhere near third floor west. So like, <laughs> Sub basement west, maybe. Like- <laughs> I love, actually, I really like that actress because she's just like really put off by what's happening and knows that she's deeply in trouble doesn't know that there's such thing as slayers so she she yeah. knows this woman's dangerous but it's like it's like just, yeah oh. if someone in a like one around a hospital gown asks you what year is it <laughs> <laughs> there's like i mean yeah nobody's bothered to clean those walls in like 30 years there's tiles missing like yeah. it's also like the broken down part of the hospital i mean that would be like the first trigger that you're in the wrong place it's like this is this couldn't pass code as a McDonald's, you know. It's like, oh, is this a part of the hospital? It's like a, it, yeah, it's silly. Yeah, some of it, it like fine. she was looking for like you know her grandma or something. Yeah. Like, she knows where she's recovery like, ward. <laughs> I can't believe you didn't have guards stationed here. <laughs> and they're like, well, we just thought if she, she if she ever woke up, she would just wander these hospital corridors forever. Uh, <laughs> yeah uh yeah so she steals that girl's clothes and she goes on a downtown walkabout um and i thought it was really similar to vampire willows downtown walkabout in doppelgangland they mm. they kind of play that same note of like like the person who's like <laughs> it's funny because it's like the person who's so evil that walking around down a uh, busy downtown is like weird and terrifying for them <laughs> Or like normal people, children. There's children in this world still. Travis and I, uh, when we watched this, Travis made an interesting point about how this is kind of like this carless fantasy downtown. Yes. And like this, and so, and so you're. It's already like a. It's almost like a dreamlike version of what a downtown would be, given that there are no cars, and that there's like that marquee movie theater, and like this. We've seen this exact same sequence. Like, hey, actor, yeah, A to B, this. You know, when Buffy went to go see a movie with Angel, like this is the downtown scene, the lot, yeah. this thing. And it's just got this fantastical vibe to it that totally, like, I don't know, it, they use it to good effect in this app because, you know, you know, Faith looks like she's out of her mind a little bit and like everyone else just going about their biz is like beautiful contrast. And I also like, like, cause that downtown is so small. There's so many like memory triggers that it's like, yeah, that's the marquee where I shot Angel. And over there, right there, that's the knife store that Buffy and I broke into. (laughs) (laughs) Totally memory lane. I'm going to call that street memory lane. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So yet another in the uh, history of sweaters designed by the criminally insane. Uh, if you look at the bottom of the document, I have a good screenshot of uh, good. Willow's sweater, which is three features three people's heads, and then they have bodies that are made of like rectangular patches of fabrics. Well, I think Two they're in sleeping bags. Bananas. It's very 3D. It's very like textured. Mm-hmm. Weird. It's a weird sweater. That's all. I liked uh, Xander's sweater at the beginning. I don't know if we yes, it's very loud because it it's like a sensible sweater in a way. I mean, for Xander, it is. It is. It's, it's loud, down but, for Xander. It's, but it's you know, it's a sweater vest. It's not. It's not crazy. It's not like you know, five different sweaters sewn together end to end or some other shit. That <laughs> Do you think on Willow's sweater, the person in the middle is Buffy? Oh, who are the? Other it's two? like I don't know. That's what I'm trying. It's like her sleeping. It's like almost a thematic sweater right interesting like a sleepover sweater right yeah well looks oh, like oh i thought those are their bodies i guess they could be like sleeping bags yeah that's what i've been saying what does it mean that's the cryptic sweater can we do uh like a long form 
conspiracy cast about the sweaters and what they mean <laughs> yeah that should be definitely like a, a separate youtube it's just like buffy related conspiracies so willow sweaters every dream sequence sweater virgin <laughs> well yeah not sweaty virgin <laughs> Hi, I'm Michael Poli. I've never worn a sweater. <laughs> That's not even the direction I wanted to take it. That's great. <laughs> I'm going to look at what sweaters are based on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Turn up the thermostat. It's time for Sweaty Virgin. <laughs> so uh, speaking of virgins, yeah. Riley not knowing who Faith is as a punchline. Hey, who's Faith? Yeah, so funny. Great. I wanted to include it almost as a great line, but I just like want to call it out because it's kind of amazing. And then, of course, that Buffy's going to lie about Faith to him is not shocking either. <laughs> she lied about it because she tells you all the like cons- some conspiracy ideas about who Faith is. Yeah, you know, a bit Whack, like, wacky identical cousins from England. Which is the worst lie. None of that holds up. This woman looks nothing like her and has no English accent. I, I took that to be a joke, but that she yeah, really did lie about Angel, which is kind of Buffy's MO, like. Yeah, but it's also like the way they frame that makes it sound like, and the way this episode frames it is like so much about how the Buffy Faith relationship fell apart because of Angel, but like, that's only the end of that relationship. That's not like what tore them, I don't know. It just feels like people are rewriting their own personal history and making it all about Angel when it's really all about them. (laughs) And we could do something in themes about this, but it's really funny how dismissive Riley is of Faith as a, an opponent and like is not not really present. Like in the, you know, to jump ahead a bit, when in the sequence when, you know, Faith and Buffy are like have a confrontation, like Riley should be there. And like the fact that he's just sitting in his dorm playing with his balls <laughs> or whatever the thing is. <laughs> and I mean that literally because we've called out the ball you know, poster so many times. And the fact that they're right there by the bed, so you just want to play with them. Yeah. <laughs> but like, he's too, so dismissive of what she is. And so either Buffy is being, you know, she's lying to him about how dangerous Faith is, which is possible. Or like, he's just can't imagine female power or like female danger. That one. Yep. I almost <laughs> wonder if like, she didn't properly explain that he, that she's a, that Faith is a slayer also. Right. Or if, like, because he must by this point understand how strong the Slayer is. He's been kicked across the room by one. Like, he doesn't. He's not, he's not he that smart. He doesn't. He's not that smart. <laughs> he, like, forgot. Yeah. I kept all those memories in, the si- in my side. And I got skewered. <laughs> I also think it's weird. Buffy never told Riley about the Watchers Council before. Like, I just feel like there's a lot of, like, her personal history he's not getting that I think ha- is supposed to happen when you're like dating somebody you go over like at least the last year of your life right and that means she's never properly expa- explained Giles like he still has this like puzzle about who Giles is in her life right I like he did, he didn't understand what she's talking about anyways that's true I, and her her description doesn't like properly land what the council is anyway right yeah, yeah. How would you explain the Watcher Council? It doesn't make sense. I'd be like, watch the first season of Buffy. <laughs> I've watched all of Buffy, and I still don't really feel like I understand what the Watcher Council is or does. Well, they're back, baby. <laughs> yeah, they're definitely back. We, they got yeah, a helicopter. And clear, like, ready to come at a moment's notice when some nurse calls. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's happening. <laughs> Watcher Council. That made me wonder if, I mean, this is a dumb unimportant thing but like is she a full-time employee of the watchers council or did they hire or did they like or was she already face nurse and they're like we're gonna you know give you money if you ever call if you call because but she seems so unreacting to seeing a helicopter landing and everything that flew all the way across the atlantic yeah well she's a deep deep cover you know informant of some kind like informants get paid when something happens yeah right? it's not like you're just constantly on the you might have some small stipend but it's got to be so small so where the hell are they every other time a damn thing happens well that's the thing is right like they don't really give a shit about like demons and stuff they're just like obsessed with the slayers i'm curious to see, well yes i'm obviously curious to see what the watcher council is going to do while they're there since they just show up and leave an imprint 
Uh, but I, I also love, so moving on to another noticing, I love Faith's reveal on campus where literally Buffy's talking smack about her and then Faith turns around. Yeah. And, and like, it was such an awesome uh, reveal. And then just, I can't believe how insanely confrontational Faith is. <laughs> like, I get she's magically strong and so she can just jump out of a coma and be ready to like handle everything. But just out for revenge instantly is amazing. <laughs> it's just so insane and so i think in this episode everyone's like she's a homicidal lunatic she's crazy like all that feels completely true yeah it's like because like right up until that point like it does like the first time i watched this i'm always like why is buffy like immediately upset about faith because the last time they interacted it was a good interaction they had like magical information sharing she like woke up and gave faith like a kiss on the forehead like there should be more like relevance, but it's totally deserved. <laughs> I think we're gonna have tea. You tried to gut me, B. No, it's uh, really interesting how the storytelling on this one works because we're getting totally Faith's perspective on their relationship, and like up and like we were totally against Faith when Faith like ended up in a coma. Like Faith had sided with the mayor. You know, she'd kidnapped. You know, they were kid like kidnapped Willow. Like they were. It was like messed up high school confrontation that was that was like gonna go down I, I don't know and then like her version of events were totally i'm yeah. somewhat i'm somewhat like concerned about faith like i'm totally i'm kind of on her side when we that confrontation does happen but then it, i feel like she's so extreme that i i lose it with her it's funny also there's like you know i think part of the feeling feeling her point of view is like she watches the gang through the window and it's like similar to Spike watching the vampire gang drinking that guy up in Pangs, right? Is that in Pangs? Um, but I was also like, how did she even know to go to Giles's? Like, why would she know that that's their hangout? Uh, she can use a phone book. That's true. I just mean like, they didn't hang out at Giles's last time she was awake. Right. Um, she figured that out quick. Uh, she can use a phone book. But yeah, I don't know. I really like that scene. I love Faith on campus. But when when they run away, Faith jumps over like a brick wall and then Buffy like immediately loses her. I was just like, that, that was very lazy of Buffy. Like she's obviously hiding right behind that wall. Like, <laughs> didn't even try, Buffy. Oh, I just love how Faith goes from like zero to a hundred in, in the revenge category. Like she just... She's just been eight, just been waiting, just waiting for like sweet revenge. Like it's, and she's so crazy. And it's actually great to have a good, bad, a good, bad character on the show. Just like legit off her rocker. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like, it's like Spike, oh, this Spike is has gotten more like mm-hmm. gray area. Like, yeah. yeah, let's just have somebody who's just out and out, like out to murder. And Buffy was like, maybe Faith will be different this time. And it's like, no. Um, I love after she snaps the demons, the demon messenger's neck, and then she like runs up the fire escape to escape the cop car. And not only does the cop car not see face foot, also completely misses that dead body. <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you're a cop, do you only see what's directly in the light beam? <laughs> Just a little bit outside the light beam. I I am reminded of a quote from Principal Snyder. In case you haven't noticed, the cops in this town are deeply stupid. <laughs> Uh, RIP so this Snyder. is more, this is, uh, yeah, R.I.P. Snyder, Armin Shimmerham. Um, <laughs> this is uh, more me trying to prompt something from Mike, I guess. But how about, how about a potential Spike Faith team up, huh? After uh, uh, Spike, Spike basically being like, I'm going to go find Faith. Oh, it could totally happen. It I mean, it'd be, like a it'd be so amazing if it happened. Uh, because right now it would be totally like the Demon Giles and Spike team up, especially since the body swap has happened. Like, that would be freaking awesome. Yes, please. Um, and so it's when uh, Faith is watching that tape in like some sort of electronic store, I guess. Uh, just that the mayor had less than a day to make that tape and to get the device built, like while also planning his ascension. That all happened real quick. It, it's also interesting that the mayor seems to be semi expecting to die, which was not how season three felt at all. Yeah. <laughs> he was apparently secretly not that confident. 
<laughs> yeah, that's crazy. It is a like crazy twist on <laughs> on on the end of season three, right? I mean, it's like the way that it's positioned too. It's like this is either the tape that plays when I die, or it's the tape that plays in the history museum devoted to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just such an insane tape. Hi, kids. <laughs> I, I love those tapes. Those are great tapes. Yeah. Yeah. It's great to have Harry Groner back, even if you have to like uh, write this really weird contrived thing for it to happen. Right. Uh, he's just so much more charming than Adam, right? <laughs> <laughs> the only thing with Harry Groner, and I would say this is like when he talks to Faith and they're having the picnic with the snake, when he says you're you're too young and too pretty to have frown lines, which to me was just kind of cr- this like cringy like 1950s Pleasantville, like this is how you treat women, you know, it's all about the appearance and they shouldn't worry about these things. I mean, it's like definitely like a different era, especially compared to now. But it's just like really time, to me, it's like really time capsule Like hmm. this is how people used to talk to the people who had legitimate concerns that were women. It's like, thank God we don't do this anymore. Like that would be cringy if that was on TV now, to me, to have someone say that. You're too young, you're too pretty, you're worrying about these too many different things. You'll get frown lines. It was good in Harry Groner, but I just thought, what, to me, it was just like this super weird. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think even then it plays creepy. Yeah, like, right? That's right. Like, it, it's okay. meant to be That's creepy. his character. Okay, yeah. good. I think right. they actually the way that they've done the um, mayor-faith relationship is really cool because they've managed to make it you know, kind of very intentionally creepy, but also very explicitly not sexual, which is a cool, yes. weird constellation of things because oftentimes those will interlap like crazy yeah, yeah. but it, uh, you know also like obviously the guy who's been the mayor of a town for over 100 years like is deeply invested in the patriarchy right he's not woke. <laughs> he's, I mean, like, he's not woke. And- i get that i get that <laughs> i'm just i'm just saying it, it's, it's weird yeah uh and mike has a cat on his lap what does the cat think this is youtube only cat so, uh, John, you got the next one? It's hard not to just praise this episode. One of the things I want to praise is I just miss Joyce. We haven't seen Joyce in an age. And yeah. boy, did I miss her on the show. And it, I, I think it was neat, although we get a lot of different Joyces episode to episode, especially like in season one and season two. There's like a lot of like, sometimes Joyce is, you know, crazy panicked all the time and she's really fussy. And sometimes Joyce doesn't seem to care about anything Buffy does. Yeah. And this Joyce is like... That's- tough it's like tough joyce which i don't feel like we've necessarily seen before but i really like tough joyce yeah see her be a badass yeah i think like we talked about this a lot back in the beginning like i think it took a long time to figure out for the show to figure out who joyce was and she was just like the mom for like maybe the first year and a half or more yeah right but it's not really until the end of season two where she like finds out who the, the buffy's a slayer that like they can actually like start to have like a real relationship yeah I mean, it's also think, realistic that, like, when Buffy goes to college, we don't see her on the show for almost a year. Like, that's realistic. Yeah, I think, uh, from what I heard, Kristen Sutherland actually, like, moved to Europe for a year um, and didn't, like, yeah, kind of quit acting for a year to just uh, live her life. Hmm. It's a, such a powerful sequence with Joyce, but it really, like, it hits its peak when Buffy busts through the window to rescue Joyce after Faith kind of picks up a knife like faith you know buffy's kind of watching her and like that made me so emotional because i had no idea it's like super insane to bust through a window to rescue someone yeah but also just the intensity like it's just such an on cue thing and i was not expecting it and it's just the moment where buffy's like kind of is like you know obviously joyce kind of expects buffy to rescue her i guess and then Buffy's just like, hi, mom. It's just like, wow. It just like really works emotionally uh, for like to show, you know, the imp- show how important Joyce could be to, you know, uh, Buffy. And like, I don't know, just like floors you emotionally a little bit. Like just such an unexpected intense sequence. Yeah. Until you think about the idea that like for that to work, Buffy had to have like climbed up a tree and just be like watching outside the window for the right time. Like I just picture like... <laughs> 
Buffy hanging outside a tree outside that window, like ready to pounce. Yeah, mom's already tied up, but I'm going to wait until it gets really serious before I intervene. Like a knife is drawn and you're like, okay, yeah, this I better get in there. Or she literally just got there. <laughs> yeah, and I guess jumps from the first story into the second. I guess she's got powerful jumps. It's just like the mechanics of how that jumping through that window works are crazy. Oh, the show is totally not concerned with the mechanics. It's only with the impact of this happening immediately on cue. Ugh. Yeah, I also I love that fight scene. I love um, near the end where Faith like cl- runs that door through Buffy. That is hilarious. I love that. When you watch that, he's like, oh my god. Oh, that that's so many disposable props. Like the table comes apart. Like... Faith is like grabbing for a drawer to throw at Buffy and then like pulls some knives from the ground. Like it is crazy how much yeah. fun that fight scene is. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, so I just wanted to add some virgin thing here, which is yeah. that this is the most suspenseful episode of Buffy I've seen. And like suspenseful as a Buffy episode versus suspenseful as a TV show episode. It's suspenseful as a Buffy episode because... I haven't seen Faith in a long time. Faith's suddenly back on the show and I have no idea what she's, like her role is going to be. And like the show kind of knows that you don't know what Faith's role is going to be and kind of plays with your expectations of how Faith is going to, you know, be a part of the show or not. And like the gradual reveal of like how messed up she is and what she, like what she's trying to accomplish is crazy. And then this insane twist at the end with the body swapping tech, you know, like, cause you don't really know that tool is a grenade or what it is that the mayor has given her. And like that surprise at the end of, you know, of course with the five by five kind of quarters reveal is crazy. So I feel like as a fan, this is like the most, one of the most satisfying episodes because it's like, I have no idea where it's going. And then it ends on a place where it's like, I'm so excited to see what a body swap could do on this show. Cause we've done, we played around with like shows characters in similar ways but like to commit to something kind of extreme and then for the body swap mechanism to be immediately destroyed. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh shit. Like I kind of would, I was kind of excited by the idea of the rest of the series being Buffy in face body. <laughs> so I kind of hope that's what happens. And we just have never mentioned it to you before. <laughs> yeah, that would be amazing. I mean, we yeah. Wouldn't. yeah, we wouldn't. Or would we? I don't think we'd hold that in. <laughs> Yeah, dude, I'm really excited you you are enjoying this so much. Um, especially like I wanted to know what you thought of the body swap twist. So now I like, because yeah, you're right. It's like one of the very few times the show actually like leaves some mystery. They're usually so all about explaining stuff, but like we do not know what that device is at first. And it's I was wondering if you even thought it was totally clear at the end what happened. If you like had figured out the body swap or not but you have yeah no there's so many things and i didn't mention we didn't really mention the watcher council showing up right like yeah and the watcher council is here for some reason clearly to collect you know something to do with faith collect her or deal with faith but uh yeah yeah the no the body swap swimming is body swapping is totally unclear like I, and i love body swapping by the way that is like a secret thing <laughs> yeah maybe not, we've, we've talked about we've, it. we've talked you and i have talked about it before no, I'm into the body swap also. Um, he, he got it instantly when we were watching together. He goes, body swap. <laughs> like, he didn't have to wait for the five by five. Like, is this a, uh, like a hobby you two share? What? I, so I'm well, totally... obviously you can't do it in real life. <laughs> <laughs> or can you? I, I just think there's a lot of, like, the, I don't know. It's a really interesting thing. It's like, what? If you like, can't use technology, use magic. <laughs> Because <laughs> it gets into like what defines a person and everything. Is it your your body or your mind? Is there like yeah? No, no, we we get it. It's 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 super interesting. All right. Well, I think that's uh, weird noticings and trivia. Uh, let's move on to questions for the group. Questions for the group. Uh, John. Uh, yeah, I just want to hear Dr. Travis tell us about comas because. Uh, I don't even know enough about comas to ask the right questions. How are comas presented in this episode and how realistic is it, Dr. Travis? It feels about like coma wings of hospitals. It feels like a very Hollywood version of a coma. Uh, yeah, people don't wake up and walk out of a, I mean, the guy wasn't, the doctor wasn't wrong to be like, coma patients don't, will not wake up and walk out of the hospital like the way Faith did. 
I mean, obviously this is a really fun coma interpretation. But also, we, I think we make, um, Spike makes fun of, or Spike keeps mentioning that he watches Passions, like that soap yeah. opera. This was like a super soap opera episode because in soap operas, there's all these people in comas who wake up and do exactly what Faith does. Right. So it's kind of like this weird soap opera version of Buffy. We're like, oh yeah. So, so, so to be clear, it, people in long-term comas like Faith was, first of all, that's real. Yeah, that, they could be, yeah. And yeah. then people can recover from that sometimes, but it's not an instantaneous wake-up is what you're saying. Right. And I think, uh, I think the sometimes is being a little bit generous. I, okay. <laughs> but there's, I mean, this is different, but there's medically induced comas that people get. Put yeah, ex- exactly. That's totally different than what, like, this appears to be. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, there's a lot more care in the real world when someone is in a coma. Thankfully, they're not just put in a dark, stinky, <laughs> decrepit wing of a hospital and left to just kind of melt away. Thank God they're not done that way. But it's, uh, this one makes sense on screen, I guess. I, yeah. I mean, I also think, like, if anyone's going to wake up from a coma and be immediately walking, it's like a superhero. Right? Exactly. A superhero, supervillain. You know, I wasn't sure. I think I was just, yeah, I think she's just a, um, she's like a mutant. She's not a superhero and she's not a supervillain. She's just kind of got her own stuff going on. I don't know. I was trying to come up with the right words for her. She's just like a anti-hero. Slayer. She's Venom. She's just a slayer, I guess. I don't know. There's she's just like a powerful being with like a really confusing morality, <laughs> moral code. Uh, she's chaotic neutral. Uh, uh, Mike? Yeah, so I was love the mayor's tape and it made me think, what's on your if you're de- if you're watching this and I'm dead tape that plays to, you know, whoever it is gonna watch your tape. I would love to have one that was actually recorded on VHS, but it was recorded like twenty years ago or something when I was in high school. <laughs> like is no longer like has any connection. So I'm like you know, <laughs> I don't know, whatever I was into in high school. I'm like but then, then yeah. like you could you could cut a new a new if you're watching this I'm dead and then like when you're actually dead we'll cut together all the different tapes <laughs> like a highlights like a highlight <laughs> yeah, it's just like, of my it's like my diaries but I always present it as if you're watching this you're dead it'd be great if like your fears <laughs> change like when you're a child your fear would be like captured by the boogeyman or like you know I don't know killer bees or like being being if you're watching this i've been killed by killer bees <laughs> it's like you're older it's like i've been killed at a school shooting and then like older it's like you know i've been killed by a terrorist attack and then older you know it's like great to see like the things a decade by decade what you're afraid of yeah i also like or, or like because nowadays you're if you're watching this i'm dead tape would like autoplay on youtube right yeah so it'd be like um Something I'm still alive, but I forgot to like reset it. Like I have to reset it every week. Oh man, there. Oh man, that's a great app, like a dead man switch for YouTube. Someone yeah. To work on that. You have, to, like, you have to like enter a code every every month or every six months. You have to it and it won't like make the video public, right? So when you stop entering the code, then the video automatically uh, gets published. Yeah, the dead man's trigger or dead man's tape. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like there's only a handful of reasons to have one, right? It's like there's secret information that you need to impart to someone and it, that really, that only impacts them now that you're dead, which is like, you can't, you get, you need to help. Like if there's any mysteries that you're involved in, in your life, you have to kind of like, here's the secret information to solve those mysteries. Like all the ones that I'm involved with or know about. So it's like, here's the mysterious information. Um, letting people know that it's okay to die, which it seems like a thing like, Hey, I'm dead and it's okay. Move on with your life, life partner. Um, I guess that's the mystery for me. Yeah, I, I definitely tell my wife like it's okay to move on and be with someone else and please Aww. don't wait around because I feel like that's impactful, right? Yeah. Um, and then like, I don't know, like how the will is going to be like dealt with, like to have it in some kind of recorded format to say like, okay, please take everything uh, or give half to my nephew and make sure that this like red mug goes to, you know, my neighbor down the street, like, you know, like some kind of video will for someone that doesn't get, you need to go to a lawyer for that. Uh, I don't know. I feel like that's how it gets used in movies, but yeah. personally I would just, yeah, I think the letting my wife know it was okay. And yeah. then letting my family know that I love them, even though I don't talk to them very much. I think all wills should involve puzzles. Oh, like <laughs> if, uh, if any of you die before me and your will is not involve a puzzle for me to solve, I'm be very disappointed. 
Oh, I hope when I die, I can amuse you. <laughs> yeah, how how long would you like to be amused? You know, 10 <laughs> minutes? You want a crossword puzzle or? I can do the riddle of the Sphinx, but I'm really, that's, that's my limit for puzzles. <laughs> yeah, just copy paste puzzles from my book for John. <laughs> Yeah. You must John, solve this maze. <laughs> John, I leave you my book of mysteries. And it's like literally just like crossword puzzles. <laughs> Five across. <laughs> if you solve this, you'll find my killer. And then the other thing to play with from questions for the group for me was the with the body swap buzzer. So if you had a body swap buzzer for a weekend, what do you do with it? <laughs> I Constant. thought about this all day. Constant swapping. That's what I do. Oh, okay. You don't you just know, stay around. That's interesting. Now I want to get as much, if I got it for a weekend, I want to get as many new bodies as possible. Well, see, I, my first thought, which is kind of awful, is I was thinking you'd want to swap bodies with a baby to like maximize how much you're extending your life. But then first of all, you're basically murdering a baby. And also like there'd be a baby in your body. And that'd be hilarious, but you wouldn't be able to do anything it about it. It would be awful. It would be <laughs> they would be able monster. to walk. He'd be <laughs> like a horrible person. Why is John so drunk? He can't even walk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it'd be fun to be a baby, though, with like an adult conscious. Yeah, consciousness. That would be intense. I was thinking like you'd want to swap bodies with someone from a different a different sex, like to really maximize your experience. Like yeah. you were like, I want to maximize my time. You swap with someone who is very unlike you. Yeah, total. Gender swap is like the first thing I think of. And I would gender swap with my wife. In like that makes a, a lot of sense. That's I, If I had a partner, that would have been my first answer. Was like a oh, that's partner. a good idea. And you could like, it could be consensual, which would make this whole thing much more moral. <laughs> yeah, you need someone to talk to about the experience and what person knows their body better. Well, I mean, I guess everybody knows their body really well. <laughs> but... I guess you want someone to safeguard your own body so they don't like run it off a bridge because they're like they think they've gone insane. You know? I've also always liked the idea of like if you're like body swapping with like with a villain or something, they get your body and then they're just like, ah, you take such bad care of yourself. <laughs> Why does your back hurt this much? This isn't normal. Oh god! Like you yeah. body swap like right before you have to go to the bathroom, and then the other person has to like suddenly hold it in for you, and you're like, what the. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. You could body swap with a physician and that way they would know like what was normal or not normal about your body. That would be very helpful, like a diagnostic. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to shake your hand for a couple of months. <laughs> 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 Note to self. No, I, the, I love the like little baby one though, because like if you've ever read League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, it gets to this weird, there's a weird villain that gets introduced that like totally just like is eternal because he just swaps into a younger body prior to his death and it's super fucked up um but i love that kind of villain and i don't feel like it's been used very often i think there's the curious case of no 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 it's there's, there's something uh, for being john malkovich yeah uh, there's that and there's uh that octavia butler yes that's the one i was thinking of. i couldn't think of the Is name. that wild seed right no or, forget but it's yeah he can switch bodies so then it becomes a question of like how disposable bodies become if you like are centuries old and you don't really have morals. You're like, uh. an angel has a disposable body character, like a Thank body you. swapper in season one, but yeah. apparently has to switch bodies constantly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Draws a lot of attention to yourself that way. Big mistake. All right. I think those were some extra weird questions. Uh, so thanks, Mike. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to uh, recommendations. Recommendations. Um, so my first recommendation is probably going to be a little controversial these days, uh, but the Woody Allen movie Sleeper, because um, it both involves like somebody having a time jump. Um, and the specific reason I thought of it instead of other kind of movies like that is Xander calls the blaster like a orgasmatron or something and that always reminds me of uh there's the like orgasm machines and sleeper um so i know that like woody allen is like a controversial choice these days um so take that recommendation with a grain of salt i guess i'm not gonna like get into defending him because i'm not gonna do that uh this is an older movie i don't know uh i'm gonna recommend the dead zone based on uh the stephen king book starring uh what's his name oh what's his name Christopher Walken? Yeah, Christopher Walken. Thank yeah. you. 
I don't. Sorry, that was really dumb of me. It's like a forgotten Christopher Walken. Uh, it was also like a USA TV series, mm-hmm. but I don't know. Right, anything that had Anthony Michael Hall, right? Yeah. 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 But why would you watch Anthony Michael Hall when you can watch Christopher Walken? Why not both? <laughs> but it involves <laughs> a character who like um, wakes up from a coma and he's gained like supernatural powers. Um, there's also the great coma movie Patrick, the Australian horror movie, where uh, the guy in the coma. First of all, he's in a coma with his eyes wide open the entire movie. Uh, he becomes obsessed with his nurse and has psychic powers and like telekinetic fire starting powers and stuff. Really weird movie. Uh, Quentin Tarantino talks about it a lot, actually. I just brought up Woody Allen and Quentin Tarantino together for some reason. Uh, <laughs> uh, and this last one is only an aesthetic recommendation. Eloise is actually like a really terrible movie, but it's a 2017 Eliza Dushka movie where she's running around in an abandoned like insane asylum that looks a lot like the wing she woke up in the hospital so that's <laughs> why that's a wreck but it's like a terrible movie so don't actually see it it just like connects well now eliza dushku won't be on our podcast ever thank you <laughs> dude i have so much praise for eliza dushku it goes beyond let me tell you <laughs> <laughs> i'll see any terrible movie you're in all right uh let's move on <laughs> to predictions Virgin Predictions. Okay. Um, so, Michael, you are currently at uh, 64.375%. And let's see if we can move that number up or down. So, uh, I'm going to kind of do these in reverse order. Let's see. Okay. So, in Season 4, Episode 7, Mike, you predicted that Riley is going to take over the initiative. And we decided to kind of, like, not deal with this one a couple episodes ago but in this episode riley does say i'm in charge to forrest and forrest says for now which to me tells me that he is in charge right now so can we confirm this one for mike what do you think travis he's really confident that he's in charge i mean we keep dancing around they keep mentioning it i think we have to give it to him because although we don't think he's in charge of the scientists the episode keeps saying he's in charge so i think we have to give it to him just based on what they're saying Dennis, you concur? Yeah. All right. Great. And in back in season four, or actually rather at the um, the wrap up we did for season three, the, the wrap up we did for season three, Mike, you predicted that Faith is going to wake up from her coma in season four. So that is definitely confirmed. Woo. And finally, and this is one I'm glad we kind of got to, um, in season three, episode 13, Mike, you predicted that Faith will get slut-shamed by Xander in a future episode. And in this episode, uh, there's a moment where Buffy says, uh, we don't know what she's thinking, what she's feeling, and Xander says, who she's doing. I think that qualifies. Yeah, I, I think qualifies. Xander has slut-shamed yeah. Faith. Although it's that really is- Willow who slut-shames her the most. True. Right. He, she literally calls her a slut, doesn't she? A yeah. slut bomb. Slut bomb. Yeah. <laughs> but Mike was right. Xander did say who she's sleeping with. Okay. So I think that's all confirmations for you, Mike. Thus placing you at a 65%. Whoa, we got out of 64 territory. Yeah. How exciting. Up to the whole new percentage point. Well, going to ruin things with more predictions. <laughs> uh, so uh, I have a lot. I want to have as many predictions as possible about the Faith and Buffy body swap things because that's interesting to me. Um, so I think that Faith as Buffy will kill Adam. Buffy as Faith will be kidnapped by the Watcher's Council. I wrote kidnapped away. Sorry, she'll just be kidnapped. <laughs> uh, kidnapped Buffy, away. Buffy as Faith. No, I'm sorry. I meant Faith as Buffy will team up with Spike. Excuse me. I, I got to get these straight. <laughs> faith as Faith. Faith on Faith. Faith as Buffy will team up with Spike. Uh, Buffy as Faith will uh, almost have sex with Riley. I don't oh. think they'll actually have sex. I think the show will pull back, but I think we'll put them in a sexual situation where they almost have sex, and then Riley will notice something about her. Maybe that she doesn't know what this little scarf is that looks like panties or whatever that Riley's holding. <laughs> but 
<laughs> something will pull him out. He's like, oh, you don't know about all my ball collection or whatever, something, <laughs> you know, and like. I like that there's like so little distinctive to pull from for from Riley. That's like... <laughs> my, my ball collection. Or she's not going to know that, you know, she's going to like, she'll get into the initiative, I think. Oh, I'll just put it here. Yeah. Buffy has faith. Will get access to the initiative. We'll get into the initiative office, I guess. Even with that, though, she doesn't know the code. And then uh, Giles will punch something, punch someone rather on the watchers council. It's going to get heated. And then Willow will unswap faith Buffy. Using technology or using magic or using, using magic. No, no way technology can solve this. You can't do it online. <laughs> Both of you click this web, click this link in your email at the same time. <laughs> it's like the body swap version of two-factor authentication. <laughs> it's like trying to pair your uh, Bluetooth devices. Yeah. Never works the uh, first time. For next week, I want Mike to come up with recommendations because you're the end of the body swap. Oh, yes. Just, holy. Just think about recommendations. Freaky Friday, the Freaky Friday remake. <laughs> I think we can get deeper than that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, if you if you let me recommend uh, comic books like manga, because yeah. this is such a subgenre for anime and manga, uh, then I have many. Lindsay Lohan, Parent Trap. It's a good body swap. Well, there's two people. They don't, they don't swap bodies, but they they actually swap. <laughs> there's two characters. I feel like that's also confusing because she's in the Freaky Friday remake also. Well, yeah, yeah. But it is like one character is swapping out for the other character. Oh man! Speaking of Lindsay Lohan, did anyone see that video where she got slapped by like that homeless family? That was so weird. Uh, no, it was sound- like a real video where she's on the streets of Russia, and there's like this immigrant family on the streets, and she like tries to take one of their kids. Like she thinks she's doing a good thing, and she's doing it as an Instagram story. And this is real. She like tries to take one of the kids, like. And the parents freak out and slap her, and that's how the video ends. And it's like her, f- it's so weird. Lindsay Lohan's lost her goddamn mind. Anyway. But she chose to post it, right? Yeah. No, she was posting this live. Like she was trying to help this family by taking the kid. It was so <laughs> crazy. Weird. That sounds like Logan Paul level insanity. Yeah, looks like we got a theme. You guys want to do themes, deep stuff? Deep stuff. Sure. So I just have the one theme which we pulled out of weird noticings, but just the male and female power, kind of uh, the way it's expressed in this episode, where you know Riley is super dismissive of female power, and yet we see female power is like a super dangerous force in this episode, uh, but it's it's constantly under, it's constantly dismissed. It's even dismissed by other characters in this show, which is interesting. Like you haven't, it just so many interesting setups in this episode where you have Spike, for instance, who would be a very powerful and dangerous force, but is kind of uh, neutered. You know, you have Riley, which could, you know, could be a helpful, you know, force also sort of neutered, but you have the super powerful Buffy Faith characters, strong female power, but just constantly under, uh, you know, just constantly dismissed by the male universe. But yet we see the pl- these kind of like these powerful forces like act out you know, their power stuff. And it's even over a mother character, you know, over Joyce as a mom figure. And it feels so, like such a strong story. And like, I can't, but I can't tell if it's intentional or not, which is again, like I'm also dismissive of the writer's powers to put this together, but I'm I'm sure that it is intentional. Uh, but yeah, I just want to talk about this. Like there's this clear, like this male female power thing that happens. And then this episode just felt very strong. Uh, any other thoughts about that one? I, th- I think you covered a lot, Mike. That was good. Good analysis. All right, great. Well, anyway. All right. So that's been uh, Buffy Virgin. Uh, I've been your confused host, Dennis St. John. Uh, you can buy my comics online, denniscomics.com. Uh, I'm in the newest issue of Famous Monsters, which is out now. Uh, and you can find Buffy Virgin at Buffy Virgin Pod on Twitter, Buffy Virgin on Instagram, BuffyVirgin.com. Uh, yeah, follow us and uh, make comments and give us nice ratings. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, hit that like button and we'll see you in hell.